So welcome everybody. This uh, webinar is called Ask the Experts About Hostas. I'm Diane Blazik. I'm the Executive Director for National Garden Bureau. You're going to see uh, some links popping up in chat and those are coming from Gail Papston, our office. And I would love to introduce our panelists now. I'll just briefly introduce them and let each of them uh, tell you a little bit more about themselves and their company. First of all, we have Georgia from Monrovia and we have Laura from Walters. So Georgia, I'll toss it over to you and you can introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, like Diane said, my name is Georgia. I am the plant selections manager at Monrovia Nursery. Uh, we are a wholesale nursery supplying independent garden centers and Lowe's throughout the country. Thank you, and Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Robles. Um, I am a product manager for Walters Gardens for the Northeastern portion of the United States. Um, and we are a breeding company and young plant supplier uh, for the United States and Canada. So we breed lots of different genera, including hostas. Um, and then we also are a partner with Proven Winners. So some of the varieties that we uh, breed and supply, some of the ones that you'll see in this presentation are part of the Proven Winners perennial program. Um, and then others are just part of our Walters Gardens offering. And as you told us right before we started this webinar, you are going to be speaking at the hosta University? Pasta College, yeah. Pasta College, yeah. Yeah, it's in uh, Piqua, Ohio um, in a couple of weekends. It's a big kind of Midwestern thing for Hosta folks. So for anybody on this webinar, if you're in the Midwest and would like to inquire about that, um, I'm sure you could Google it, Hosta College in Ohio. Okay, um, a couple kind of overview questions for you guys, and then we'll go into our presentation of some of the, your varieties that you've chosen to present. And then toward the end, maybe the last half of our webinar, we can get to some of the tips about growing hosta. So first of all, it is the year of the hosta. I mentioned that 2024 is our perennial. And so maybe let's just start, George, I'm going to toss this one to you. Where did hostas originate? Yes, hostas are originally, they're native to Asia. So Japan, China, Korea, uh, you can find them as you might imagine and growing in like moist woodlands, maybe along streams and rivers um, around in that Asia, in that Asia area. Interesting. Good. Um, and Laura, since you're with the breeding company, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what's what's happening in breeding? What are they breeding for and what's the process? Um, so the process, um, briefly, there's a couple different ways that new hostas are created. Um, one of them is through finding sports. So hostas have an incredible amount of uh, genetic variability that they express. Um, and so uh, breeders and even just kind of um, avid hosta collectors alike are always on the lookout for new fun sports, um, which is basically just a genetic mutation that happens naturally. Um, and sometimes they do something really cool. Um, if you find one that's like that, uh, you have to test and make sure that it's actually going to be a stable sport that, uh, you know, consistently does the same thing. Um, so that's one way. And then another way is through kind of old fashioned hybridizing, cross pollinating. Um, so we do some of both of those uh, types of uh, breeding work here at Walters Gardens. Um, and some of the things that we specifically are breeding for or that our breeder loves to do is um, we do a lot in like the large and giant classes of hosta. We find that both of those sizes are really popular. Um, so I'd say we do more breeding work in the bigger sizes than in the small sizes. Um, and then Hans, who is our lead breeder um, and has been breeding hostas for a long time, has some specific traits that he really likes to put into his breeding work. So a lot of them have kind of a cascading habit, um, very rippled edges are a couple of the things that he really likes to put into his breeding work. Uh, but it's very specific to breeders. So you'll see different breeders who try to incorporate different things um, into what they do. Great. Um, and Georgia, then I'm going to toss this question to you. What about some traits? What, 
what are things that consumers are asking for? Um, what are the retailers asking for? Is it is it specific or is it general? Is there are they wanting the large or the small or the variegated or the blue or what? Yeah, you know, I think with Haas says what makes them so fun is that there is such a wide variability about what is out there. There are so many different varieties and people are just interested in adding something that's different. They really love the texture. So so if we can find something that's that's unique that people can sort of add to their collections. Um, I think Diane, you mentioned you're not quite a collector, but people do that. They get a whole bunch of different hostas, variegated and blues and yellows. And so just things to add more diversity to their mix is what people are generally looking for. Um, we do see a lot of people interested in variegated varieties, of course, like most other plants, they love the variegated foliage. And then also seeing an uptick in blues, um, blues are feeling very calming and a lot of people are really interested in that sort of calming experience in the garden and hostas can do that both in their lushness and also in that blue glaucous foliage color. Great, thank you. Okay, so let's go through this presentation now and Laura, you're starting first. So I will let you get started talking about the hostas that are in this first part of the presentation and then we'll flip over to Georgia so she can talk about hers. Okay, sounds good. Um, and I will try to remember to um, mention with each of these whether or not it's a proven winner's variety um, just because I know some people like to know that. So this one is Above the Clouds is one of our newer Proven Winners introductions. Um, so this one is a large class size hosta, very powdery blue foliage, very cupped as you can see from the photos. And with maturity, you get that corrugation or the um, kind of textured surface to the foliage. Um, so not something that you're going to see on a young plant. Um, typically it takes two or three years for that heavy corrugation to really show up on any hosta variety. Um, this particular one has lavender flowers um, in the middle of summer. Okay, and another question, I know that everybody's going to want to know <clears throat> about zone hardiness. So I don't know if you wanna make a blanket statement like they're all hardy to X and Y and then just talk about any ones that are not falling in that category, does that work? Yeah, so um, all of these are going to be hardy from zones three to nine, basically. Um, we do find there are, you know, specific varieties that do a little bit better in some of the more southern climates, but as a general rule, three to nine covers all the hostas. Thank you. Okay. Um, Autumn Frost. So this is one that's in the Proven Winners Program that has been around for a number of years. Uh, but it is such a popular hosta. People really love this coloration. It's one of my favorites. Um, this is more of a medium-sized hosta, so it doesn't get super big, only about um, 12 inches or so high and up to a couple feet across with maturity. But it's really that coloration that people love. So it comes up in early spring with this beautiful blue center and a bright yellow edge. Um, and then over the course of the summer, as it gets warmer, that yellow edge changes to a cream. Um, so it's a, still a striking color contrast, but it varies from spring until later in the summer. Um, and this particular one has light lavender flowers in mid to late summer. Uh, Coast to Coast is another approval winners variety. Um, this is a giant size hosta, so this one does get very large. Um, we work with outside breeders as well at Walters Gardens, and this one was actually developed by a hosta breeder by the name of Olga Petrosen. Um, who's very well known for her hosta work. Um, and she is working on developing um, hostas that are named for each of the 50 states. Um, and then this one is just kind of a broad coast to coast. Um, so if you ever hear of like Key West or some of those different hostas that have kind of a name that refers to a particular state, um, more than likely that came from Olga's work. Um, so coast to coast is this nice kind of vase shaped, beautiful bright gold hosta. Um, it will be more gold colored in a little bit more sun. So if you can have kind of a morning sunshine um, to it, if it's in full deeper shade, it will be a little bit more chartreuse-y. And then it does have um, a kind of a gentle ripple to the edge and some nice corrugation on it. Um, Diamond Lake is another Proven Winners variety uh, that we introduced, oh, probably five years ago or so. Um, this is a medium-sized hosta in its general habit, but the individual leaves are massive. Um, with maturity, these will get up to about 9 to 11 inch across. 
Um, so very, very large leaf size, nice kind of bluish coloration um, and a kind of a gentle ripple to this as well. And some nice corrugated textured uh, leaves to this as well. Um, Drop Dead Gorgeous this is one of our newer varieties that is not in the Proven Winners program. Um, just extremely beautiful variegation, kind of multiple different layers of colors going on here. Uh, from that kind of lemony chartreuse edge to the middle darker green and all sorts of different shades of greens and grays in between there. And then um, hands is just characteristic kind of arching habit and beautiful rippled edges to the foliage um, just gives us a very, very pretty presentation. And this is another giant pasta. So this one will get big. Echo the Sun is a newer um, gold or yellow introduction into the Proven Winners line. Um, this one is different from Coast to Coast that we just looked at because it's a little bit smaller. Um, whereas Coast to Coast was a giant size variety, this one is a large. Um, it also tends to have a little bit more leaf presence down low, whereas Coast to Coast is a little bit more of that vase shaped where you see a little bit a uh, little bit more of the petioles down at the bottom before you get up to the leaves. This one has kind of leaf coverage top to bottom. Um, this one we compare a little bit to kind of like a golden or yellow version of Diamond Lake that we just looked at. So it looks very similar in habit, um, a little bit more prostrate habit, but kind of a goldish version of the Diamond Lake. Um, Etch Glass is another member of the Proven Winners Hosta line. And I should mention, um, just as I'm talking about all these different Proven Winners varieties, that they are all grouped into a series or a collection that we call Shadowland. So if you ever hear anybody referring to Shadowland Hostas, uh, those are the collective name for all of the Proven Winners Hostas. Um, so Etch Glass is a medium-sized Hosta. Um, that was actually a sport that was found out of a, a very well-known hosta named stained glass. So it has kind of the same coloration as stained glass, uh, but a wider margin. So a, a much wider dark green margin, um, nice creamy center, and then some yellow and light green kind of jetting in between there. Um, and as this variety matures, uh, you see a little bit of puckering on the green margin. So kind of in that center photo here, you can see a little bit of it. So instead of just a flat leaf, you get some nice texture from that puckering. Empress Wu, um, this is one of the largest hostas on the market. So this is a big boy or big girl, whichever one you wanna call it. Um, this will get larger than six feet across with maturity if it's in a good um, setting for hostas. Um, of course, hostas will get larger if they're in the correct conditions in the garden. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but a big hosta, it'll get up even to 48 inches or so in height at maturity. Um, nice kind of deep bluish green, very large leaves. Um, and then a nice kind of darker lavender purple flower. Uh, Hope Springs Eternal is a newer member of the Proven Winners um, Shadow Cla uh, Shadowland hostas. Um, this one has these beautiful kind of heart-shaped uh, blue foliage with the creamy um, margins to it, very rippled. And the foliage is held kind of at a horizontal um, angle. So it's not um, it's not as upright or downturned as some. It's more of that horizontal angle to the foliage. And one of the things that our breeder Hans uh, says about his hosses is that he really likes to breed for varieties that are going to be um, distinguishable from, you know, 10 feet away or so as something different. He doesn't want to just have it be, you know, another hosta that looks like just like anything else. So I feel like all of these are doing that where you can tell from a little bit of a distance that there's something different about them. Uh, Love Story is one of our newest varieties um, of Proven Winners hostas. Um, so this one has a very elongated heart-shaped leaf, uh, again, with that kind of slight ruffling to the edges. Um, and then what's kind of unique about this one is that it's got a multicolor variegation and that center medial variegation of creamy white extends all the way to the leaf tip. Um, so a lot of hostas, you'll see the central variegation, but the margin will, uh, you know, encompass all around the way of the leaf tip, whereas this one, that central cream pattern actually extends to the tip of each leaf. 
Uh, Miss America, um, this one is another fairly new introduction a couple of years ago to the Proven Winners line of hostas. Um, this one actually has um, some elevated ploidy in the genetics, which basically means that it has an extra set of chromosomes. Um, and one thing that that does is give some thicker foliage, um, which equates basically to good slug resistance when you're talking about hostas. Um, it also gives it very good vigor for a variety that has as much white in the center as this one does. So even though it has this high degree of white medial variegation, it's also quite vigorous. Um, it's a medium-sized hosta. And then what's really cool about it is that the flower scapes are massive. They get super tall. I'm five foot four. And when I walk out into our display garden um, in the time of year when all the hostas are blooming, this one has scapes that are taller than me. So um, very tall, blonde, light white flower scapes. And then the flowers themselves are um, whitish with a nice purple central pattern to them. So very pretty flowering performance. Uh, Seducer is one of the older members of the Shadowland series for Proven Winners. Um, beautiful vase-shaped habit on this variety. I absolutely love this plant in the garden. Um, if you ever are at a gar garden center and see it in a container, you may not think it looks all that great. It doesn't, in my eye, it doesn't display as well in a pot. But once you get this plant in the garden, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's got a nice yellow margin. Um, with the green center. And then in between those two colors, you get some white streaking or jetting that uh, comes on with the heat of summer. So uh, when it first comes up in the spring, you won't see that white. But as it as you get a little bit warmer throughout the season, you see that white jetting. Um, that's just, it's just a gorgeous hosta. Uh, Shadowland Hudson Bay. Um, so this variety is actually a, um, sport or an improved version of a variety called Eskimo pie that's been around for a while. Um, this one is going to have a wider margin, um, a little bit more of a blue tinge to that outer margin. And then the creamy center with some, um, apple green jetting in between. This is another one with very good thick leaves that are good for slug resistance. Um, and overall kind of a medium to large size here. Um, Silly String is one of our newer, um, what we call non-branded introductions, so not in the Proven Winners brand. Um, this is a fun plant. It was actually um, the giveaway plant when the Hosta Society or American Hosta Society had their uh, convention in Michigan a few years ago. Uh, so this was a giveaway plant for anybody who attended that event, which unfortunately had to be virtual because it was during COVID years. Um, but this is a medium-sized hosta with very narrow, very, very ripply foliage, extremely wavy and undulating foliage, nice blue, um, a little bit more blue in the spring. It does turn a little bit more green through the season, but then about the time where it's showing more of that green coloration, you get this beautiful um, kind of medium purple flower display. So I feel like some hostas have really great flowers and other hostas have okay flowers. And I'd say Silly String is in the category of really, really great flowers. Just a, a beautiful presentation of flowers. Um, terms of Endearment, this is one of our newer non-branded introductions. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this one is because um, there's a variety that's been around for a long time. Um, I believe it was developed in around 1936. It's very well known. It's a nice hosta called Francis Williams. Um, this is actually an improved version of, of Francis Williams. Um, it looks very similar, but what's different about this is that the, the chartreuse margin doesn't burn. So on Francis Williams, um, as the season progresses, you almost always see some degree of that edge burn on it. Um, and this variety will look very similar, but not have that burning characteristic. Time in a bottle. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, newer non-branded introductions. Um, I think it's a very striking color contrast between the foliage and the flowers um, for one thing. So it's got these nice kind of semi-narrow, not quite as narrow as silly string, um, gently waving foliage. And then these beautiful dark flower stems with a very dark purple flower, but the flower on these remains as a closed bud. So it never actually opens into an open flower. 
um, which actually means that they last longer on the stem. So you have a longer floral presentation and then the contrast between those dark colors and the chartreuse foliage is just very nice. Uh, Voices in the Wind, this is another um, more recent introduction to the Proven Winners line, um, three or four years ago now, I think. Um, so this is very, very classic Hans Hansen breeding, very arched habit to the plant overall, and then very nice ruffled foliage. Um, so this one is more of that medium green coloration with the yellow um, ruffled edges to it. Water Slide um, is another member of the Proven Winners series um, that has been around for a little bit longer. Very good powdery blue coloration that lasts throughout the season. So this one maintains that blue coloration for a long time. It's a medium sized hosta, so it's never gonna get super large. So it's great for like front of the border um, in your hosta bed or in just a mixed uh, you know, shade woodland garden. Um, and then this one also has a very nice floral presentation. I should have given you another photo to add that uh, included the flowers, but they're held very, um, not too high above the foliage. So where some hostas get really tall scapes um, and that's a nice look, but then so is that, you know, flower coverage right over top of the plant. Uh, so very nice flowers on this one as well. And then we, um, we is another member of the Proven Winners series. Um, and this one is always super roughly. So some of the hostas don't develop their roughly or ripply um, traits until they're a little bit older. This one displays those uh, ripples and ruffles from a very young age, uh, even before its first vernalization, which is basically a, a cold treatment through the winter. Um, and you can see a little bit at the bottom of the stems in, in these pictures that even when those pips or eyes are first coming up out of the ground, they're already kind of ripply and roughly. So like if I'm walking through a garden, um, I can always pick out which one would be we just because of the way it emerges from the ground. Um, and then just a beautiful um, green and kind of chartreuse colored variegation to it as well. Um, and then Wu La La. So this one you might guess from the name is actually a sport out of Empress Wu. Um, so this is going to be another giant size hosta, but where Empress Wu is that solid kind of bluish green. Wu La La has that same central coloration, but then with an apple green margin to it. Um, so similar size, I think this one is slightly, um, less wide at maturity than Empress Wu, but still gets about up to 48 inches tall, um, and close to six feet in, uh, diameter or width with age. Um, and it's just another really great, very large giant hosta. Okay. I think that means it's time for Georgia. Yeah, beautiful hostas, Laura. Um, so a lot of these actually come from Walters. So maybe we can we can shout out when it happens. But this one is Brother Stefan. Um, this is a plant 12, 20 inches tall or so, and then it'll get about three feet wide. So it spreads out pretty far. I love you can sort of see on this that really corrugated puckered leaf paired with the variegation here, irregular, vibrant, almost chartreuse center, and then many, many shades of green as you get closer to the margin. So a really beautiful plant. It does have white flowers in early summer also. And Dancing Queen, I would say Dancing Queen is probably the best yellow you can get. Um, a lot of hostas will emerge yellow, and then as they mature, they go more green or chartreuse. Um, Dancing Queen tends to stay yellow throughout the season. Uh, so really beautiful color on this. Uh, love the texture, nice veining, and also a nice wavy margin too. Lakeside Paisley Print. Beautiful uh, foliage on this with that white, uh, creamy white, almost yellow in certain times of the year uh, center that sort of feathers out from the petiole. Really beautiful, thick, robust foliage, then a light purple flower in the midsummer. This doesn't get very tall. It's about 10 inches tall or so at most. El Nino is next. This has thick blue leaves and then a wide um, white, sometimes creamy yellow margin. As that foliage matures, it'll go more white. Uh, the foliage is heart-shaped and it's slightly 
waxy. Um, that thick, sturdy foliage we find, again, like Laura mentioned, a little bit better with resistance to slugs. This also um, 20 inches tall or so, so a nice medium size. And Neptune, I believe this was the 2023 Hosta of the Year. So um, <clears throat> this is a bright blue wedge shaped uh, foliage here that almost like this beautiful cascading effect in the garden. It's really quite beautiful with its wavy margin. Um, it does have lavender flowers also in the late summer. This is 24 inches tall, so another medium size Hosta. And T-Rex, this is a big one. So a big uh, three foot tall by six foot wide or so. Each leaf can be like, gosh, 18 inches long by 14 inches wide. So really large hosta, um, large green leaves, and then a beautiful white flower that appears around June or in midsummer. And then <clears throat> broadband is a new plant. Um, this is says coming soon because uh, we received the bare root, but they will not be uh, for sale until next year. But it's a beautiful new hosta. You can see it's quite large, two feet tall by four feet wide. Um, the foliage itself emerges heart-shaped and then it becomes quite round with age, which is really special. And then that golden band on the margin almost encircles each leaf. So it's really quite a neat coloration. And then another uh, coming soon for 2025, uh, I guess, yeah, it's 24, Ooh, okay, <laughs> is Green Patriot. This is a beautiful green on green variegation. And the name Green Patriot is sort of a nod to the popular variety Patriot. Um, both Patriot and Green Patriot are known to um, handle quite a range of soil and sun conditions. So they typically do better in heat and humidity than we sometimes think of hostas doing. Um, so that's really great, nice versatility there. Then it's a nice medium size 18 inches tall or so. And gooseberry sundae that you can see stems, that's that's what we love about it, is um, these beautiful dark stems. When it first emerges, it's this almost eggplant purple color on the stems, and then it turns more red as the season progresses. And then that red, uh, the red petioles also morphs into the base of the leaf. So even the leaf itself has a little hint of red to it also. And then sorbet is much like gooseberry sundae when it has the um, eggplant purple petioles that turn to red, but it has variegated foliage. So gooseberry sundae is going to be green and your sorbet is going to be green and uh, white and creamy yellow. Great, thank you. Um, we just have a couple of other varieties that are from some of our other members that were included in our Year of the Hosta. So this one is White Feather. And as you can see, it gets its name from uh, the white foliage there. And then First Blush, you were talking about some with some red colorations. And this has it not only on the stems, but a little bit in the center, sometimes on the outer portions of the leaves. And then we have blue ivory. I mean, how much more can you explain it? It's blue and ivory. So though, oh, we've got one more bulletproof here. And so I do not know this one as well, but I am taking it that it has the thicker leaves, leaves like you guys were talking about. So a little bit more of a slug resistance. So I am going to stop sharing now. So we will get our panelists back on screen, but there are a couple questions here that I want to start with, and then we'll go into some of the general questions that we had earlier. Um, there is a question from somebody in the Southeast, which blue hosta do you recommend for the hot Southeast? Tony Avent recommends touch of class because it has a double layer of wax. So do either one of you want to comment on a good blue for the Southeast? Um, I'll agree with Tony. I do think that touch of class is a good one for the Southeast. Um, I think any of the, anytime you're going to be in the Southeast with any blue hosta, it's going to be especially important to remember to really not let those varieties get very much sun at all. So even in the North and Michigan where I'm located, um, if you put your blue hostas where they get a little bit more sun, 
Um, they're more likely to have an effect where the sun will cause that glaucous coating to melt off. And that's part of the reason that uh, Touch of Class does better in the Southeast is because it has that thicker glaucous coating. Any other suggestions, Georgia? N not that I can think of. Blues are really tough in the Southeast. <laughs> Um, so I would have to agree that a uh, touch of class would probably be the best one. Okay. You might want to ask your local garden center. They might have some personal experience in your area. That's usually a good resource also. Exactly. Good advice. So now we're going to talk about growing. Um, so let's start with the growing conditions. We know shade. <laughs> you just, you just mentioned that. Uh, what else for are the best conditions for growing hosta? You know, we think of hostas as being true shade plants, but they really do appreciate some morning sun. Um, that's especially in the variegated and the and the golden varieties that does make their color shine the best. If you give them a lot of shade, sometimes they can green go a little bit green on you. So uh, morning morning sun is is beneficial. Yep. And then in addition to that, um, I totally agree with all of that about the, the sun and the shade degrees. Um, hostas really do love a fair amount of water. Um, so they will survive um, drier conditions, but to really thrive, they really do like a fair amount of water. Um, so in my yard, for example, um, the hostas that are in lower areas that get a little bit more of rain collection and water on their own, um, I don't have to water as frequently, but then some of the ones that are in higher and drier spots, um, throughout the summer, if we're not getting, uh, very much rain, I will typically run a sprinkler on them, um, at least to try and give them about an inch a week, um, because they really do thrive off of that higher water content. Um, and then also fertility, um, they really do like um, a little bit more of an organic, um, organically amended soil. So if you, again, it's it's a very forgiving plant, you know, people can just stick them in their yard and forget them and they're going to be fine. But if you really want to grow a nice specimen pasta to its full capabilities, if you want to grow an empress woo and have it reach six feet across, um, that's where you're going to want to give it some compost or do something to, you know, provide some fertility and organic matter. Great, thanks. Um, you know, with with a lot of breeding, they're, they're making impatience for the sun, they're making, you know, they're just doing a lot of new breeding to where it's like you can grow them anywhere. Are they breeding any hostas for sun or are there any hostas that do better in the sun? There are some hostas that do better in the sun. Um, certain ones definitely do do better than others. You know, June, uh, Paul's Glory, like I mentioned, Patriot, and then the new one, Green Patriot, um, some in substance. Generally, um, yellows and variegated foliage tend to do better with more sun, whereas the blues maybe less so. Um, but I would be curious, Laura, if if there's any breeding work specifically in that area. I'm not sure. Yeah, there are some um, that have been bred for that purpose. I mean, there's one, I think, called Sun Power. Um, some of them actually have the name Sun in them to indicate that. Um, I'm actually going to give a little shout out to, there's a great resource online. It's called the Hostel Library. Um, and if you just Google the Hostel Library, or maybe Gail can throw it up there. Um, there are lots of lists that are compiled on there. Um, actually, uh, there's, uh, somebody named Don Rawson that lives near here. He's the president of my local hosta club. Um, and he has done a lot of list compilation. And so there's lists on there that you can look at for, you know, which hostas are best for the sun, which hostas are best for slug resistance, stuff like that. Plus a massive photo library of just about every hosta you can imagine, um, and lots of good other articles and resource and, you know, information on there too. So. I also would like to say just as far as this, the sun conversation goes, um, is that it really depends on where you are. You know, if you're farther North, you're going to be able to get away with more sun. If you are in the South, 
you're going to need more protection. So it really depends on where you're at. We live in a big, diverse country with a lot of different uh, climates, and that's going to affect how hostas will perform in your garden also. Yeah, good point. Because somebody was just asking about um, in the Kansas City area, um, it gets a little sun until about 2 p.m. and then partial sun, but it can get very hot there. So I love the uh, recommendation of the Hosta Library. So it sounds like that would be an excellent place to go and search for the Hostas for your individual conditions, because none of us have exactly the same growing conditions. Yeah. And the other thing I think to keep in mind with Hostas, when you do put them in more sun, they're going to want even more water. So uh, the same Hosta planted in more sun, but given adequate moisture is going to perform a lot better than if you pop a hosta into a fair amount of sun and then try to force it to grow in, you know, pretty dry conditions, it's going to suffer a lot more. Okay, great. So now there's two questions related to deer. So first of all, are there any deer resistant hosta varieties? My answer is if that deer is hungry, no. <laughs> nope. And I then wish. Yeah, exactly. Um, can you provide advice for planting in pots and overwintering in pots? She's doing this because of deer. Um, but what about planting hosta in pots and overwintering in pots? You can definitely do that. Um, they overwinter in the pot. They will go dormant. They're not evergreen, so the um, they they will drop all their leaves. You can, if you live in a really, really cold climate, you know, they are hardy to zone three. So if you, I would say if you're five and up, not a lot to do for overwintering a hosta in a pot. But if you are colder than that, you might want to, you know, move it to a, a an unheated garage or so, uh, or a shed, something like that. Or you could even group them together. If you have multiple pots, you can group them all together to insulate. Um, and if it's going to be really cold, you can always protect them with, you know, some people use like burlap sacks or surrounding with, I've seen some, I've seen some really interesting ways to insulate pots throughout the winter, but, um, but you definitely can do it. Just make sure that of course there are drainage holes and that you put some good quality potting soil in preferably with some compost and you should be okay. Yep. One thing I'll see too, if you're in an area where you get a fair amount of rain or snow throughout the winter, um, is if you can't move them into an unheated garage or shed, um, sometimes if you tip them on their side, um, so they don't collect so much of that moisture during the winter, because that's one thing that affects a lot of overwintering plants, not just hostas, is not the cold necessarily, but it's the winter wet. Um, so just even tipping them on an angle or on their side can help with that. Great. So let's go back to that deer topic. Any, um, any experience, any good tips, products, or anything that you guys have been able to use to keep the deer out, keep them away, keep them from eating them? You know, I think it's a lot of trial and error. And I think it's a lot of, it's going to depend a little bit on your local deer population too. I see, I'm on a lot of hosta forums online. I'm a huge hosta nerd um, and love to collect hostas and grow hostas. And I don't have deer in my neighborhood, but I do have rabbits, which are also a huge problem. And I spend <laughs> countless hours and countless amounts of money trying to fight my little rabbit population that loves to come in and eat my plants. Um, but, you know, some people will post online that they see certain things working. And when I try it, I don't have any luck and vice versa. So a lot of it is trial and error. And a big part of it is staying on top of applications of whatever you're using. So whether, you know, you're using some sort of an animal repellent, um, I find that I really have to get out there and apply practically weekly. Um, and a lot of them will say rain resistant, but if you get a hard enough rain, they're, they're going to wash off. Um, and then I also find that it's a little bit seasonal. Um, early spring when the plants are coming up and have like their, you know, super juicy, succulent, early foliage is the worst time. That's when all the deer and all the rabbits are just out scouting your yard and looking for all of this, you know, salad. Um, and then later in the summer when stuff's a little bit tougher um, and maybe doesn't look as good, so we wouldn't care as much. That's when they're also like, eh, we're going to find something else to eat. 
Yeah, there was uh, a couple years when my garden was new and all my new hostas were coming up. And yes, the rabbits would just devastate them. So I started saving up all my coffee cans. And in the spring, I would put the coffee cans out. Didn't look good, but it was in the backyard. And it was funny, once those hostas got a little bit more mature, they were not that young, succulent, tender shoots. The bunnies started leaving them alone. And then I pulled the coffee cans off and they didn't bother them as much. So. That was just my little tip that worked in my backyard. Uh, let's see here. Um, you had both, well, let's see. I think there was maybe one miniature hosta. Let's talk about miniature hostas. You know, what size kind of qualifies as a mini? What are your suggestions on how to use them? I think they'd be great in combination containers, but uh, what else can you tell us about miniature hostas? Well, I think that miniature hostas, they have to be, I think they're under nine inches tall. Is that the classification of a mini versus a small? Um, they're pretty, I mean, blue mouse ears is a classic mini hosta, right? A lot of people know blue mouse ears. Um, really nice for containers or small window boxes. If you have something like that, we, you know, of course we all want this lush foliage, but there's a lot of great applications for hosta because they are so forgiving um, in smaller spaces. So, and I, uh, so blue mouse ears, there's also mini skirt, which I think is the 2024 hosta of the year. Um, and that's a mini as well. Yeah, one fun thing that um, we've done here in our display gardens is put them um, in like kind of a lower, more shallow, like a hypertufa container mixed with some other stuff. Um, Hans and his team not only do our hybridizing and breeding, but they also curate and run our display gardens. And they've actually um, done some where they've mixed them with like little small conifers, um, kind of collector type conifers as well, um, and have actually used some um, styrofoam containers that they make to look as if it was a hypertufa container. Um, so there's a lot of fun things you can do with minis. Sounds fun. Um, let's there's one question here. Did any of the blue hostas in the presentation have touch of class in the parentage? Is there a good place to see the parentage? The hosta library does not have that info. Um, so there is an online resource that I've used before where you can kind of see um, a fair amount of information in terms of who um, who sported into who and some of the parentage that's been used in crossing. Um, unfortunately, I'm having a hard time remembering the name of the website, but maybe what I can do is get it to you, Diane, if I can find it. Um, yeah. and then you could, you know, distribute it or, or, you know, whatever. I, that would be great. Yes. Because, um, I don't know if I mentioned that in the beginning, we are recording this and we will send it out with additional links about Hosta. So you can send me that link. We'll make sure we put the Hosta library. I'll send uh, a copy of this PowerPoint so that everybody has all the, um, variety that we went over. So yes, that's good. Um, next up is, uh, we talked about water. What about dividing and transplanting hostas? I know I've called, um, I've heard them called the friendship plant because they're so good and easy to share, but talk about dividing, like how frequently, uh, when is the best time to divide? When is the best time to transplant? I think some of that is going to depend on your region. Um, in the north, you can pretty much divide most times of the season that they're, you know, up from the ground, um, again, given that you are going to provide adequate moisture. So it's probably the most forgiving time, spring and fall, when it's a little bit cooler. I've divided and transplanted hostas, though, in the summer, and as long as you're going to, you know, care for them and water them, um, they're fine, but I wouldn't necessarily advocate to do that if you're in, you know, the South or somewhere that it's hotter than what we are up here in Michigan. Um, 
Yeah, the nice thing about Hassa is they grow in those nice clumps. And so if you were able to get them, um, you don't have to get them out of the ground to divide them. You can just, they're pretty forgiving and they're pretty forgiving to, for um, if you cut through the roots, that's okay. Um, they they don't mind as long as like Laura, like you mentioned, get them watered, get them taken care of. But what's nice is that if you dig them out of the ground, they sort of, you can see where they've clumped. And so you it's pretty easy to, to, um, divide them and transplant them and, you know, give, give them to your friends as Diane mentioned. <laughs> There's a great tool that is fun for how to give it to your friends or whatever. And that's called a hoary hoary knife. Um, and it's basically, um, a garden knife that has either one or both edges with serrations and you can just go down in and dig a chunk out and lift it out of the ground. Those, those are super helpful for pastas and gardening in general. And as far as the timing um, of when to do it, not every hosta needs to be divided. It's about, um, you know, if they're overcrowded, I would definitely divide. That might be, you know, every three to five years. Um, I also have found that typically you'll see maybe a little bit of loss of vigor. The The foliage might get smaller or the, the crown, the middle crown might be dying out. And so that's a good time to divide also. And if you do that, if, you know, say the middle crown starts to die out, don't use that for your transplant. You know, you can get rid of that and then use the other clumps um, for a more vigorous to, re to reinvigorate your plant. What about um, cutting off the flower stalks? I, I've heard some people say, oh, I just cut them off and I don't I don't let them go to bloom. Maybe, maybe it's just dependent on, you know, what quality flower is. But is there any recommendation there as far as after they're blooming? Do you just leave them? Do you trim them back before fall and winter? So um, the, my rule, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, so it sort of depends on what, what you like. I've, I've had plenty of gardens that where I did nothing with the flowers and, um, my hostas were great, um, but, but, uh, cutting off the flower escapes after they've bloomed, but before they produce a seed can be helpful because it'll, it'll give that energy back to the plant itself, as opposed to spending that energy producing the seed. So that can be helpful, um, to grow more vigorous roots and, potentially produce more leaves the following season, but um, it's really up to you. They can also be used in bouquets, um, sort of an, a, a, an interesting um, bouquet flower, cut them, I think when just a few flowers have opened and the rest will gradually open up in your vase over a couple of weeks. Yeah, I usually let my plants flower um, and some of them are really fragrant as well as being attractive. Um, they're also good pollinator plants. Uh, you'll see bees uh, visiting the flowers pretty frequently. Um, the one thing that I would suggest, though, if you want to cut your flower stems off, whether it's before they open or after, um, be very careful with sanitation because there are some viruses that can be spread if you are taking the same, you know, pair of pruning shears and going plant to plant. Um, so if I'm doing any sort of trimming on any of my hostas, I am basically taking a little thing of uh, isopropyl alcohol with me into the garden and dipping my shears between every single plant. Now, I'm also obsessive about it, so maybe you don't have to go to that extreme that I do, but I don't want any of my hostas to uh, get a virus that I've unintentionally spread from plant to plant. Um, and I did end up, you know, anybody who gets it all involved in hostas will hear about the dreaded hosta virus X. Um, and I did end up with a couple of plants in my last yard, uh, in my previous house that had it. Um, so I'm very paranoid about, you know, doing that to myself again. So, so you moved homes. If you got a virus, you just moved homes. That's yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, just pick up. And move homes. <laughs> um, no, but once, if you do get hosta virus X, you have to get rid of the plants. You have to not plant another hosta in that location for a number of years because any root material left in the ground can still be infected. Um, I had to bleach my shovel that I used to dig the plants because I didn't want to accidentally transfer it. So it's it's kind of a big deal if you get it. So that's why I'm very careful to not spread it. 
Good point. Um, somebody is asking, which hosta do you recommend for good perfume? The, the scent of the flowers. I'm plagued by, um, I can't smell hosta or dianthus. Um, it's very sad. So I don't know if I have a great recommendation. Um, I do know that guacamole and other um, varieties like that can be um, pretty fragrant, but I have yet to smell them myself. And Laura, any recommendations on the perfumed? Looks like her uh, video froze. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, we'll go on to the next question, which is about pests. So let's talk about slugs. I heard both of you say that the thicker leaves will resist the slugs. Um, so what if I have one that's not a thicker leafed one? Yeah, and you know, even the thicker leaves, we say they resist the slugs, but you know, the slugs still will try. There's no such thing as a truly slug resistant variety, but you know, um, they have some great slug bait. I live in Oregon and so slugs are the bane of my existence. And I use a lot of sluggo and other things that the garden center tells me to use there. You can also do beer traps, which um, I've tried in the past. Um, sort of interesting, the, the, the beer attracts the slugs and then they essentially drown in it. Uh, so that can be helpful, but it's, it's, you know, you have to, you have to, um, to dump that out and that's sort of, so I, I prefer just using a sluggo, but they are, they do really love those hosta leaves, unfortunately. Yeah, they do. And I know one year, um, I don't know what kind of event we had and we were using dozens of eggs over the period of a couple of weeks. And, um, so we crushed those up and as long as they're surrounding the, the hostas, it really worked on the slugs. Now I don't have the big slugs that you do. I just have the tiny little Midwestern slugs. I don't have those big beefy Portland things. <laughs> Welcome back, Laura. Um, any commentary on slugs, keeping them away, preventing them, planting the right, maybe more resistant ones. Yeah, I don't know what's already been said since I had a little issue here with my computer. But um, yeah, it's slug resistant varieties, thick foliage varieties. Um, you can put out slug bait um, if you're comfortable doing that. Um, those are probably the main tips. Yeah, yeah. I think you can also use diatomaceous earth around in that similar way to the shells. You can use diatomaceous earth and put that in a circle around um around your, that, that can help sometimes. Okay, good. Um, Laura, I think earlier you said something about fertilizer, but I see we've got a couple questions here. Uh, what fertilizer is recommended if you don't have compost or any other tips on fertilization? Um, if you don't have compost, um, I mean, I personally like, uh, there's a product called Melorganite. Um, and I like that because it provides um, fertility, but it also um, can help to keep deer and rabbits away. Um, but I mean, any, you know, like a triple 10 granular application is fine. Uh, just about anything really you can use as long as, you know, make sure you're following the label recommendations. Um, I would probably look at something that is going to be higher in nitrogen. Uh, which is the first number. Like if you're looking at a fertilizer label, it's always got three numbers and it's NPK. So the first number nitrogen is, a, is what's really going to help hostas the most um, since it's the nitrogen that's going to build the leaf expansion and everything. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's tons of different options for fertilizer. And is there an indication that your hosta needs some fertilizer? I mean, I'm thinking back and I'm not sure I've ever fertilized my hostas. Um, so is there something you're looking at? I mean, are they just not growing? They're not expanding? Does the leaf color change or something? What's my indication that I should fertilize? I think in most garden soils, you're going to have enough fertility where you're not necessarily going to see um, any like signs of nutrient deficiency that say, hey, I need, you know, some food. It's more just 
if you want your hostas to get bigger and lusher and reach their full capacity is when you would want to be fertilizing. And typically you do that in the early spring would be to, a shot of fertilizer then. And then maybe, you know, like six to eight weeks later, you might want to do it again. Um, but that's that's about it. I, they're not a heavy feeder, so you don't need to over fertilize by any means. Okay. And so fertilizer is taken up by the root system or foliar spray, which one is better? A slow release, maybe a granular slow release, something that will go into the roots. Okay. Okay, good. Um, are there any other pests that, um, so we, we've talked about rabbits and deer and slugs. Are there any other pests that um, really like these hosta leaves like we do? There's a couple of less commonly seen ones. Um, they can be fed on by nematodes, um, which you're never going to see with your eye, the nematode ex itself. It's it's a very teeny little microscopic worm-like organism um, that gets basically inside the foliage, inside the leaf itself of the hosta. So you're more gonna see the indication that they're there when you see the damage, um, which on hostas typically is kind of a longer wedge-shaped or constricted by veins on the leaf, um, brown area. Um, but it's not something that I think you necessarily need to like go and worry about. It's just, if you ever happen to see longer tannish brown leaf constricted damage, uh, it could be that you have nematodes, in which case I would just cut those leaves off and dispose of them. Um, and you'll at least get rid of the source of them being inside those leaves. Um, cutworms is another one, the caterpillar larvae that can sometimes feed on hostas. But I think the rabbits, deer, slugs, snails are the, the main ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can get, you know, black vine weevils can, can play, but those again, not super common, but they, they can happen. So if you see irregular notches along the, it looks like a caterpillar along the outside of the, the leaf, um, they can also, the larvae can feed on the roots and the crowns, so that can cause some issues with yellowing and wilting foliage, um, but again, not not super common. Because I'm actually one. glad you said that about roots, because that brings to mind voles, and that's another more common serious pest on hostas that don't feed on the tops, but they do feed on the roots, and especially they like to come along in the winter months when you're not even out really in the garden, and tunnel through the yard and get into people's hosta roots. Um, so what some people will actually do is use um, like a mesh or netting that they plant their hosta into in the ground uh, that basically prevents the voles from getting to at least the main part of the roots. Of course, once the hosta grows enough, some of those roots will grow out through that mesh, um, but at least the main portion of the root ball is then protected. Otherwise, what you'll sometimes find is that when you come out to your yard, um, basically all of the foliage and tops of the hosta just kind of comes off of the ground. And that's usually a pretty good indication that you've got some bowls. Hmm. Uh, let's hear. You mentioned yellowing leaves, and that is something somebody asks. Why is my hosta turning yellow? So I'm assuming there's several different possible reasons for yellow leaves. Could be too much sun. Yes, and it could also be um, irrigation issues, either, you know, um, crispy yellow leaves, sign of underwatering, but um, soggy yellow leaves are signs of overwatering, of course, classic signs. Um, yeah, but too much sun can also cause yellowing. And then the other thing that somebody asked about is why are my hosta plants rotting from the bottom leaves up? There are um, some crown and root rots that can affect hosta. Um, usually if it's rotting um, from the bottom up, that is why it's usually that you've had some sort of an infection from one of those fungal pathogens it's it's usually a fungal pathogen 
Um, I think partly um, citing them in good conditions can help to prevent that. Uh, you know, hostas like a lot of water, but they don't want to be in soggy waterlogged soils. Um, they like to be consistently moist, but still well-drained soils. So avoiding those waterlogged areas is one way to help prevent that. Um, if you ever do see that starting in your garden, um, you can get um, some, you know, home homeowner available fungicides um, from your local garden center that you can apply to try to at least prevent the spread of it um, or the further progression of it. And we typically see a lot of uh, crown rot issues more often in that high humidity, high heat, like the southeast will get more crown rot um, just because of the nature of the climate out there. Okay. Uh, what about fall cleanup? Should you cut your hostas down before the first frost, after the first frost, wait until spring? And I mean, I'm asking from a zone five perspective, and it might be different in different areas. Yeah, in a northern region, I mean, we're zone six here. Um, I let them get totally whacked by frost um, to the point where once they're hit enough, um, they'll go through stages of starting to yellow and then brown and then become so papery that you can really just pull the foliage away from the ground. I don't ever cut them. I just wait till they get that um, that frosted, that desiccated, that you can basically just pull them pull the foliage up off of the ground. Um, and I usually do do it in the fall. There's a lot of plants that I don't do in the fall. I leave until spring cleanup, um, much probably to the chagrin of my neighbors who probably think I'm nuts with all the plants up in the winter. But uh, hostas are one of the few that I definitely do remove the foliage. Um, again, just from a disease prevention perspective, if there's anything there um, and you're pulling up that dead foliage in the fall, you're going to remove the source of disease. So, And slugs also. I know for me here, um, that that foliage, if I don't pick it up when it's, I do the same when I, when I can easily take it with my hands, that's, that's when I, that's my cue. Um, but if I don't do it in the fall, it's a good place for those slugs and snails to overwinter. And um, we don't like that. So got to get rid of them. Got Got to get rid of them. Yes. Yes. Um, so what about, uh, let's talk about design or companion plants for hostas. Laura, I'm looking at the background there and it looks like it's all hostas along a nice path. But uh, do you guys have any favorite combos that you like to plant with hostas? I mean, of course, there's so many different types and colors that that could um, vary. But tell us some of your favorites. Well, I love, you know, the classic perennial hellebore and hookra and just some things that sort of play with the texture and the colors paired with the, the hosta is really quite lovely. Yeah, I love to experiment with just anything and everything that I can pop into a shade garden. Um, I'm one who likes to have beds that do kind of look like the one behind me. This is our display garden or our hosta walk in our display garden here at Walters. But I have beds at my house that I designed similar to this. Um, but ferns are another good option. Bulbs, uh, because, um, you know, tulips, daffodils, all sorts of spring flowering bulbs um, will come up early in the spring. And then about the time that their foliage is getting real ugly, then your hostas come up and cover it up. Um, there's later blooming bulbs that can be used in a shade garden. Uh, Mardigan lilies are kind of a fun one that gets a lot taller than a lot of the hostas and has this beautiful lily um, flower at the top. So there's just all sorts of options between bulbs and um, shady woodland type perennials. There's some shrubs that can be used, um, some understory trees that can be used in beds. There's just tons of stuff. Good, good. Well, guess what? We've used our hour again already. We can keep talking about hostas, of course. Um, I'm ready to go out and plant more and plant some companion plants with them. Um, very fun. So 
Thank you to Georgia and Laura. Um, very good information, good tips. I loved the photos of all the varieties you presented. That's just, I mean, the vast diversity among hostas is unbelievable. So I'm glad it's the year of the hosta. Um, but with that, thank you to all of our registrants. We're gonna send out a recording within the next 24 hours. Um, so, Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening, and um, go out and plant some additional hostas, everybody.